Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Lorenzo's Music Podcast. On today's show, I'm going to talk to a hip-hop artist based out of New York named Donny Ozone. Donny Ozone is actually a performer who started out making acapellas. Donny started doing that on a site called CC Mixter, which is Creative Commons musicians sharing their tracks so other people can remix them. And from there, Donny went on to release stuff on SoundCloud and then got picked up by the net label that we released one of our EPs on called Block Sonic. And Donnie consistently releases stuff with the Block Sonic net label, and he hosts the Block Sonic podcast where they play new releases and artists from the net label itself. Now, we talk about different ways of making music, the equipment we use, and one of the biggest conversations I wanted to have with Donnie was getting drum sounds. I love hip hop drum sounds, but I can't create them through our stuff with our live drummer. I would love to get that kind of sound. So I kind of asked for some advice on how Donnie gets those sort of sounds. And we talk about that kind of production technique, but how I could apply it to analog drums. So it was a fun conversation. We talk about just music and creating and releasing and just all the different types of stuff that uh, we've been doing. So check out the show. Here it is starting right now. I'm Donnie Ozone, and I make hip hop music. I've been making it for a long time. I released through Block Sonic Net Label, um, which I'm, I know you're familiar with. Mm-hmm. And I'm also the host of The Block Report, which is the Block Sonic podcast. Yeah. It comes out once a month, and we review the latest releases from the month before. And then one of our artists, Time Zone LaFontaine, does a Block Sonic catalog mega mix. It for it's a 20 minute segment where all he just reaches back into the catalog oh, and right. mixes it all up. It's great. I love it. I think that's such a great. I think I just didn't know. know what it was called. I knew, <laughs> I knew yeah. that you guys did that. <laughs> We're going with Mega Mix for now. So, okay. yeah. Um, and then the last segment. It used to be the top five countdown, but for 2024, we're switching it up and we're going to do an artist spotlight or maybe like a crew spotlight. So like uh, Cheese and Potsy are part of the Puck crew, so we could maybe do an entire Puck crew spotlight, play like five or six songs from either the crew or the the artist or latest album or whatever. So, um, yeah, that's what I mainly do. Yeah. And I yeah, I don't release a ton of music. I'm kind of, I've been sporadic lately. <laughs> You've got like three of them so far this year. So I wouldn't say you don't release this, a ton. This year's but year's better I, so far. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But the last few years I've been kind of sporadic, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm cool with that. But yeah. <laughs> well, first let me start out because we just went over a bunch of things that I want to ask you about. So, uh, but first, Great. where are you located right now? I'm in Brooklyn, New York. And I'm in Southwest Brooklyn, which is Bay Ridge near the Verrazano Bridge, if anyone knows where that's at. So, okay. Yeah. No, I don't, but you know, okay. <laughs> yeah. South Brooklyn, we'll say that. How long you been yeah. there? Uh, exactly 10 years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And then I was in Boston before that. And then I was in Pennsylvania before that. Okay. So, yeah. Now, you started <laughs> off by saying you're on the Block Sonic Net label. And yes. that's how I know you, because we've also, Great. I mean, I knew Block Sonic before my band had released an EP on there. Um, ac- actually, one of uh, one of our songs got heavily promoted because uh, Mike from Block Sonic, the person who runs it, put our stuff on one of his, uh, he, he did like collections of Creative Commons music on the Free Music Archive back before uh, yes. WFMA got, or WFMU got rid of it. Which yes. is unfortunate. I still don't understand why they did that. I mean, wait, I do, but I don't. You know, I wish they wouldn't have. But... I wish they wouldn't have. I totally agree with you. Yeah, it's still yeah. there, but it's also... All right, now we're going off on a weird tangent, but I'm going to start anyway. So Let's the thing it. was, is it was a great place for Creative Commons uh, musicians and artists to upload their stuff. And people mm-hmm. would go there to find music for videos. And that's mainly how a lot of our stuff would get discovered. Now... Yes. That's still what people go there for. But, and this would have happened anyway. I don't know if they had some sort of curation system, but now it really is music for video. Like stuff you would think is, I need 
I need some sort of backing track. Not like I need some cool band for a thing here. I need something that has strings and sets a mood of ambient night, you know, or yes. uh, suspense. And so it's a bunch of people writing theatrical pieces now. Yes. And it's I've I tried to go through there recently looking for music. And, you know, more power to them. If it's working for it, I mean, it's still a business at its core. But, yeah, it's really hard just to find bands. Even Jumendo, which is another one, does the same thing mm -hmm. out of uh, France. But yes. it's You can't find just bands there anymore, and that's unfortunate. So I Yeah, I totally agree. I feel like a lot of the Creative Commons music maybe is headed in that direction, or did it already headed in that direction where it's more instrumental because people are trying to sync it up with videos, or they yeah. get they get more of a response because that's what people are using. That's why they're looking for the Creative Commons music, and then the instrumentals just seem to work better, maybe, whatever. Right. But, but yes, when FMU had that, the FMU DJs, well, was it Liz Berg especially, she would she had a three hour show and one hour was completely dedicated to the fma oh i didn't so know that it was incredible yeah and i would listen every week and she played a lot of block sonic stuff she was a big fan of block sonic she definitely played cheese and pot c hmm. she played the impossibles um she played a few by me even um, okay and I like how you said that, like, even by me, it's like, come on, by man. Me. I, 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 I had I have this funny novelty rap about, um, it's called cookies, about baking cookies and, and uh, sort of using it as sort of uh, loosely as a metaphor. But and, okay. um, I was surprised she played that, but she, she for whatever reason, she really liked that one. Nice. <laughs> because, and I was surprised because it's like a kind of a goofy novelty song, you know, so. But um, I was so happy to be played on there by her. She's awesome. She's since left the station. Oh, okay. And then F and obviously the FMA, they parted ways anyway. They got rid of it anyway. But there was a golden age of when they used to play Block Sonic on WFMU, and I used to listen live because that's out of Jersey City, so I can get it live on my radio here, which is great. Yeah. Um, I, it's one of my favorite stations. I support them in all ways. So, but yeah. So, going back to what Block Sonic, I guess. Uh, well, before Block Sonic, I can jump back to b before Block Sonic. I was doing a lot of work over at CC Mixter. So, okay, what, do you have any experience with CC Mixter? I do, and I was actually gonna. This is one of the questions I was gonna ask because in your bio it says you first started out releasing acapella stems, and I'm like, well, the one place I know where people do that is CC Mixter. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. So. Yeah, I had made a lot of hip hop music in high school. I was in a hip hop band. We did all the Battle of the Bands and all that stuff. We even did the pep rally. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I had my own radio show for a while at that time. And then there was this big chunk of time when I still make music at home, but didn't really know what to do with it. I wasn't really pursuing it. It was just goofing around for years. Yeah. But then I, I don't remember how I stumbled across Creative Commons, but somehow it came into my life. And I had an epiphany of like, wow, what if I shared my acapellas instead of my whole songs that way? And then I, I found, doing some research, I found CC Mixter was like the perfect platform to try that out on. And it, it went better than expected. When I jumped into it, I didn't have that much confidence because I only ever had one song released before. Back in 2004, I had an Electro Clash song uh on ninth wave records okay released on an electro uh compilation like an electro pop compilation and then so that was really my only win other you know as far as releasing anything so i didn't know if anyone would just ignore me or what would happen but uh to my surprise got a lot of response for the acapellas and that lit a fire around 2011 that i've just been following ever since so I just kept following that trail. I stayed with CC Mixter for a while. And then at some point I was doing both CC Mixter and SoundCloud back in the day when SoundCloud was heavily creative commons. Yeah. And, and they had groups so you could go in there and promote yourself mm -hmm. uh, by going into the groups and talking to people and listing your song. And that was super helpful. Um, and I would even reach out to other other artists who were doing similar things and we would trade tips back and forth. So that was great, but before that all changed. And then somewhere during the SoundCloud years, Mike Gregor from Block Sonic discovered one of my SoundCloud tracks and then 
uh, invited me to start releasing on Blocksonic, and I've been releasing with Blocksonic ever since. And now I can go back to CC Mixture whenever I want, but I just got away from that. And we can talk about that if no, you want. Same with me. I, I actually just revisited it recently, and it, okay. it's amazing how this site is exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. It's such a great group of people. They're very supportive. There's no bashing or hating over right. there. And if you go in that direction, they're immediately on you. They police it very well. Yeah. And they keep the vibe positive. And that's, yeah, that's a huge part of why I love CC Mixter, um, as well as, of course, the, the collaboration. I yeah. love that you can upload an acapella. And then over the next few weeks, you're just getting all kinds of versions back, like, uh, you know, and all genres you would have never expected. And, and it's so much fun. So, so when I think of the, cause mainly just cause of the name and what I've associated it with over the years, but when I hear acapella, I'm thinking of like, it's just a, a choir. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, like five piece harmonies and stuff. What kind of acapellas were you actually uploading? Rap or hip hop? Like, so raps and spoken word okay. and maybe like faster, simple novelty raps that would be more like an electro type of electro clash, electro type of situation, like 120 beats per minute. But, but instead of like focusing on dense lyrics, it's, it would be written simpler, like, so better for a faster beat. So yeah. Um, I was experimenting with all those things, just throwing stuff at the wall. So yeah. Yeah. And then to my surprise, people outside of CC Mixter would take my vocals and use them in actual releases. Hmm. And they would reach out to me and want to do paperwork and stuff because they didn't trust the Creative Commons license. Maybe the it was the label they didn't trust it or whoever was involved. There have been several times when I've signed paperwork to say, you know, this is non-exclusive, but you have permission to use it and all this stuff for a few Well, you release under uh, non-commercial, right? Yes. No. On, well, I do now, but on my CC Mixer days, I was very adamant about doing CC by okay. for everything I did. There, there may be a few that snuck on there at the end when I went to NC, but I tried to keep it like for the most part. I was going to, I was going for a hundred percent CC by. Okay. Um, but. So that, yeah, so that so, was to my surprise, it went, it went great. Yeah, a lot of uh, awesome things happened outside, outside of CC Mixter from CC Mixter as well. Yeah. yeah, and and that was, so CC by is, that's, yeah, that makes it confusing why they would say we want to get you to sign something saying that it's okay. Whereas I yes. put it under uh, CC by SA, which is share alike, meaning that they can use it with whatever they want, but they have to put it under the same license. And the reason right. I did that is because uh, people, it, it was a weird thing. One was the, that there was a weird time period where companies started popping up out of, well, the one that did it to us was out of Korea and they would start claiming our music because they could take the music and upload it to a right service and mm -hmm. say it was theirs because they were able to download it. And then people started getting strikes and all this kind of stuff, like they would get contacted and then they'd go, Hey, I thought I could use this. And I'm like, you can, and yes, you know, that sort of thing. So I started putting it under a uh, share alike license just because it's like, well, if you're going to use it, then you also have to release it under creative commons. You can't just, which is what the SA is for. Right. I don't know if that solved it or not, but I haven't had that happen <laughs> in a while. <laughs> yes. So I had a similar thing happen with CC Mixter. I had a, a rap that was remixed by Roburo, which is one of my favorite CC Mixter hip hop producers. He does okay. hip hop and house. That's, those are the main genres he, for, um, he concentrates on. But so one of the songs that he had remixed, um, someone took that acapella, created a drum and bass song with it, signed it to a label. And then I, where the confusion came in is I think the label didn't understand that they how it all works uh, mm -hmm. they obviously didn't understand how it works because after they as soon as they released that they started issuing takedown notices to Roburo and others who had remixed that oh, exact track okay that they had full rights to to it and that yeah and they were and then so everyone was coming to me asking me hey what's going on with this you know and I'm I'm stuck in the middle like you know I don't know how I'm going to stop the label from issuing these takedown notices and they probably think they're in the right it depends what the producer told i don't know what conversations they had you know so this that. label was just like oh this is just free music people are saying you can take this music and sell it for yourself 
well, like no, that's what they thought it was? <laughs> well, no, it's a little different than in your case, I believe. This, they took the acapella and remixed it to a drum and bass yeah. with a drum and bass producer. So the odd part about the whole thing was they were issuing takedown notices for like the hip hop version, uh, a completely different genre version that has, sounds nothing like their version just because it had an, a, the element of the vocals in it. And okay. I don't even know how they were finding the other ones with the like the vocals in it that were mm. because it you know you they you think they would be looking for uh, an exact replica of the entire track of the music and the vocals right. together, but the fact they were going out after all these different people just for the vocals alone, which was strange, is very strange to me. Yeah. I don't know what was going on with that, but I did get tangled up in that, so I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah that, that's and a that's a real fun to get a fun thing to get tangled <laughs> up in because getting a hold of people is super difficult trying to find out who you're supposed to contact or the worst part is when you do finally reach someone and they respond back you know you try to be as clear as possible explain as much as you can and then they basically read the first line and they go oh i see you're having trouble uh what video are you talking about and it's like really i gotta start over then it's like i'm talking about this video i'm sorry you're having trouble with the video what's the problem you're having oh my god yes yes (laughs) Yeah. Totally. So but, with the so you were releasing uh, acapella stuff, but what kind of music were you doing? Like you were you just like I'm just gonna freestyle and talk, no. or were you doing music before that? Like what would you say is yeah. how would you explain your music? Hip hop with rap. Um, okay. So what I would do is I would make a demo, a full a full demo, music and everything and polish it up to where I got it to where I, you know, was happy with it. And then I would strip all the music away and just upload the acapella. I think in a lot of cases though, I may have also concluded the stems of the music, okay. um, but I think people were mostly grabbing the acapella is the way I remember it. Um, and then I may have eventually just started putting just the acapellas up after I figured that that was working the best at the time. So, but yeah, so I would uh, just create a hip hop track uh verse course verse style um mm-hmm. or maybe one long one long verse but no it would be written and it would be worked out i wouldn't do a freestyle or anything like that um and then but i did freestyle a spoken word piece that that became very popular called destination unknown it ended up in a lot of house tracks a few techno tracks some trip hop the thing about that is because it's spoken word, it's so easy to match it to so many different genres. So that was very successful. But that one I actually did, I actually did freestyle that. So that was a lot of fun, but um, but I only used it because it happened to come out good. I think I'd have to do that like 20 times and then just pick the best one or whatever, if you're mm-hmm. gonna go for a freestyle. But, and then there was uh, Tiny Spaceships was one I did and that was more on the electro side. I would say it's a rap, but it's super simple rap. So like I was saying before, it goes with a faster beat, but mm-hmm. it's verse, chorus, verse as well. And um, that was remixed by a producer and then it, it actually ended up on a huge BBC podcast. Oh. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the producer. It might have been... Um, I forget. I'm sorry. I forget the name of the producer. Okay. If I think of it, I'll, pop, I'll, I'll let you know. But, uh, but yeah. So yeah, like I bought. I just uploaded that to CC Mixer, and then a few months later, it was on the BBC nice. in, a, in a remix show, which was crazy. Um, so that's basically what I did. Yeah, I make the song and then strip away the music, and then either just upload all the stems or just the acapella. So how are you making the song? Like, what kind of gear or process are you using, mm-hmm. or you know that type of stuff? Like what's what's the process for you setting up a song when you do it yes i used to write my lyrics first and then create the music around that Mm -hmm. but in the last year i've swapped that around and now i'm making the music and adding the lyrics and so for making the music um lately i've been going i'll get some i'll look up a jazz song on chordify Mm -hmm. and i'll write down the chords that make up the song and then play around with those chords in a different order or you know i don't a lot of times i don't even listen to the song or maybe a song i vaguely know right or sometimes i don't even listen to it so i'm just looking for that certain sound and of, of the chords that go together i've actually done that a few times that, too yeah, yeah. cool <laughs> it's a fun way for me to make music yeah and then i map it out um and i've been making fake jazz songs where i kind of just 
riff and play to a metronome, or maybe I would put the beat. I usually do the metronome because I add the beat later, but, and I, I lay out all the chords and try to just do a, a terrible, terrible fake jazz song. And then I sample, I break that apart the stems and sample myself. And then I add the beat to it. That's what I've been doing lately. And I've like, I'm liking how that's been turning out. I did one with my, I have like a, ch a children's Casio keyboard and I did it okay. with that. And it, it came out surprised. It, it's hard. It doesn't even sound like a Casio, which I was surprised. You're not uh, talking I, about like one of those little tiny Casio ones, are you? Um, uh, the, no, the medium size, like okay. a modern day, the SA something, SA dash something. Um, the one with the orange button on it. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That automatically brings up the piano or whatever. It, yeah. But I went to my buddy's house and his daughter had the exact same one that I That's had purchased awesome. for 50 bucks. But so I've been using that. Yeah. And then one, you know, once you add like, um, the vinyl warp and everything next thing you know it doesn't even sound like a casio the modern casios have pretty good samples in them so mm -hmm. but um i've been i've been doing that because i've been staying away from sampling like actual jazz records or whatever but trying to get around that and just right. create my own and i've been having a, it's been more fun so i've been rocking that um yeah I, and so oh and then i make the instrumental then i i usually write to that that's what i've been doing lately i write to the instrumental now instead of the other way around it's much harder that piece the music together to an already existing acapella is what i find but so you're doing most of this stuff on synth is what you're saying yep synth and then i'll add some loops and now are you using the synth just as port a port machine. for midi to register midi or are you using just straight out oh. of the synth itself Okay, so straight out of the synth itself into my Tascam digital four track. That's where I make the fake jazz song. And then I strip that apart, throw it on my computer and start sampling it in a DA, in a DAW, basically. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wait, into you put it into, like you have a digital uh, thing that you're putting it in first and then putting it in the computer? Yeah, like a like, uh, digital four track. So it's the... It's a modern version of a cassette four track. It's oh, just digital. I wanted to get one of those. What's it like? Tell me about that. We we looked at a Zoom that was like that with 24 <laughs> tracks and I, oh, yeah. we never we never made the jump. So tell me about using that. I love it because I come from the age I grew up on cassette four tracks. That's oh, yeah. how I started making music. So that's yeah. why it works for me so well. Um, and I like that as a starting point and as a scratch as a scratch pad. And um, so, yeah, just like, a, I don't know if you have, I'm sure you have experience with the cassette version, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really the same thing. It's the exact same thing when, you know, it works the exact same way, same workflow. It just happens to be digital. So I'll record the piano on track one, bass on track two, uh, maybe some vibraphone on track three, that sort of thing. Okay. And then just play over myself each time. And then I take that put it into the computer, sample myself, add either a drum machine I program myself or some loop layers, depending on what ha what's happening with the song. Then I'll take that and bring that, bring the song now all mixed down, bring it back and put it on the fourth track of the digital four track. And then I'll do my vocals on track one, two, and three. Wait, you'll and actually still bounce it just like you used to with, oh yeah, I love it. Okay. But yeah. I bounce it on the computer and then I, I produce and bounce it and then bring it back over. Um, that makes it so much easier. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I can add more. And so I, I'm, so I can go beyond four tracks, then squish it back down and pop it back over and then focus on the vocals. So you can then, undo the bounce is what you're saying. If you're using the, the test cam recorder. Well, no, I'm, I'm saying that I'm, I am finishing the song on my doll and then bouncing it down on the doll to a stereo track and then bringing that back over to the four track. Oh, okay. As, so as you've already exported roll. it to the DAW. Then you're ex then you're setting it out as a two track back to the task cam, not bouncing it on the task cam to the four right. track. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Cause I was like, yeah. you're going to lose I'm, everything then. All right. All right. Yeah. I may have misspoke. I, I should say that. Yeah. No, I probably I, just misunderstood. I, <laughs> I dump it over, play around in the DAW, and then I bring it back over. And then I focus just on the vocals at that point. And okay. Then, and then um, I either use those vocals or I use those as a work tape where I then I do the I know, to memorize it or whatever. And then I bring it back over and do the final vocals on my fancy mic, which is really just an SM58. Mm -hmm. I settled on the SM58. I, I did the thing everyone does. I bought the super expensive mic and I just don't like it. It's mm -hmm. just 
it just doesn't sound right to me. Maybe it's just with what I like with my voice or whatever, but the SM58 is what I is what I settled on. And I actually yeah. found that in a dumpster. I got it in a dumpster. <laughs> uh, the company I worked for was moving and they were throwing everything in dumpsters. And there was a brand new SM58 just lying on the top of yeah. all the junk. So I just took it home. And I, I also brought home a 70s boom box that I keep in my kitchen, which I love. It still works. I've nice. still played cassettes on it. And I love that too. But um, But yeah, so... That's my process as of late, but yeah, all the rest of the years, I always wrote the lyrics first, which as uh, after talking to people, it seems to be a backwards way to do it for most people's workflow. Yeah, but I, I always, works for you too, I guess. You know. The one thing I've learned from another musician I spoke to that the only reason I did it is because when they said it, it made sense. I, of course, start out with the music. That's the easiest part. I, I, I'm not a guy who can just go, I wrote lyrics, it has structure, and now I'll put a song around it. That's just not how I work. Never have been. I need okay. to know what's motivating, what, what it sounds like, what words would work over this. I don't know. Usually what it is is I'll be dinking around and I'm like, ooh, that sounds neat. And then I'll just run from there. And then I'm like, damn, this needs lyrics now. So that's my process. But one person told me um, when I asked them about their process, they said they always start out with the chorus. Mm, and I was like, yeah. oh, that's smart. Because I'll spend yes. a lot of time making a great verse. And then it's like, oh, crap, the chorus is here. And now I got to think of something catchy. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I just wasted all my best ideas on the verse. So lately I've been starting or trying to start with the chorus. That's like the one thing that I've changed over the years. Otherwise, yeah, it's mess around, come up with a neat sounding thing and then keep building it out until it needs lyrics. But here's something I really want to ask you. And okay. it's something that I've actually been trying out lately or trying to figure out lately. Now, you said you're trying to get away from sampling and using sampling. You're trying to do your own stuff in the songs and build it from scratch. But the sound of hip hop drums, the sound of sampled drums. Love it. I always want to recreate yes. it. I don't know how to, I don't know how to dig for it. I don't know how to get it. I don't know. I, but I've always, we have live drums. And whenever I go to record drums, I just can't make them sound like sampled drums. And the sampled drums are a lot of the time live freaking drums. So yeah. what's your process when it comes to making the drums? Like, what are you running it through? How do you get a cool sound form? Like, what do you prefer? That's a really good question. And I think to get good sounds out of drums, lots of hip to go in a hip hop direction, lots of compression, maybe almost too much compression or maybe heavy parallel compression on a separate track and go crazy with it. Um, and then bleed that in over the other drum and you're gonna you're gonna get that dirty crunch okay um and then you can control it by the level you know because then the you're second. not ruining the original audio you're, you're not just... you still right you oh. still have the high five the original but you have the crunch coming in behind it sort of ghosting it and then just depending on the sound how far you want to bring it in what you're going for or that particular drum sound they're all different depending that's one way another way is uh, tape distortion effect uh any yeah tape distortion a little bit of com uh sorry um just well just straight up distortion a little bit of distortion yeah. goes a long way and also the same thing maybe bring it in on a separate track so you can control it and leave the original intact yeah so you're bringing up maybe one one track of compression uh one track of distortion and then i would probably put the tape the slight tape distortion directly on the drum, but you maybe you could do that on a separate track. I don't know. I would usually put that on the exact okay. track. That would be my formula uh, to get them sounding crunchy and and hip hop sounding. Yeah, like okay. I think that's a good one. You could also add a slight warp effect that may be undetectable to the naked ear, but uh -huh. it's there and it's subconsciously haunting the beat, which gives it that that would sound as well. A slight, a very slight warp that. That you wouldn't hear because it's a it's a dr because they're drums and it's not like a chord that you wouldn't hear. Right, it doesn't but, ring out as much. Okay, it doesn't ring out, but it, it's a good subconscious thing I think to sprinkle in there. Hmm. That's to everything that you just said sound. is so like the second you said it, it's like God, that's so freaking obvious. It was right there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was so close. I even the separate tape thing. I recently started doing sends on a guitar because whenever I tried to add effect or manipulate the guitar for something it would ruin the original sound. And that's when I was like, duh, send the, and blend it. And why wouldn't I have done the same thing with the drums? Duh. Okay. 
Um, brilliant. All right, I love it. Cool, what what cool. DAW are you using? I still use Acid. Uh, really? <laughs> Sony Acid. I haven't upgraded to Music Match yet, or whatever the name, the new name, right. the new company is. I'm still using. Yeah. Uh, my philosophy is stick with what you know with what works. Yeah, but how because... are you even running it? When's the last update been on that? <laughs> if you're using the original Sony Acid. Yeah, I have a I have a pro version and a studio version. So I use a studio for when I'm doing 16-bit projects, and I use the pro for the 24-bit projects, depending on uh, if I'm working with someone. I like to be set up for both because some people prefer to work in one or the other. So I just have the two systems set up. But yeah, I there are no more updates. I'm just running the old version on Windows 7. I'm overdue for an update, but the problem is, and the reason why I like to work with what I know is, of course, it take, it's, takes so much time out, away when you're going through learning curves. So if I can just keep moving on with what I have, I prefer to do that. At some point, I'm going to have to pay my dues and upgrade and go through learning curve, but yeah. I've just been avoiding it. Well, um, the other yeah, thing too is works, uh, so. well, we were we started out <laughs> around the same time with uh, we used Vegas, which I didn't even realize until years later. It's actually video editing software. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but we were using it for multi tracking because it lets you create as many multi tracks as you want. But then we realized the more you put, it had limitations. Um, <laughs> yeah. But my my guitar player still has it and likes to use it when he's doing stuff at his house or recording his piano and thing like that. And he's upgraded. He's since done it since uh, Sonic Foundry became Sony. And then, which Sonic Foundry, the whole, uh, that whole thing was created here in Madison, by the way, where I am. Oh, cool. Sonic, the original Sonic Foundry was I here and then that. it sold out to uh, Sony. But uh, he upgraded. And here's the thing about uh, you upgrading Acid. Um, it's really one of those like, you can upgrade, but if you want to do this, you have to pay for this license. And if you want to do that, like oh. you're going to get there and suddenly things you're normally using, you not you're going to it's going to be behind a paywall. So I'm <laughs> just telling you it's moved of. to like the Adobe model where it's like yeah. you can do this, but here's your monthly subscription to have access to it. So, just a little forewarning cuz he goes well, through that all the, the yeah. time. Yeah. Thank you for the warning and that's what that's another yeah downside of why I just stick with what works. I love speaking of sound I love Soundforge as well for cleaning stuff up. Yes. Especially yeah. with the vocals going in and cleaning things up and cleaning out noise and stuff like that and then I pair that with Isotope and mm -hmm. it takes it a little further with cleaning up some background noise. And that's um, the mastering tool, right? The Isotope or is that Ozone? Um Ozone's mastering. Okay. Uh, well, right. Isotope makes Ozone, but they make um Alloy is what I use for oh, some okay. mixing stuff. And um, I have Nectar for vocals, which is what I use the most. Oh. I'll pair Nectar with Soundforge, and I really like that. And there, you know what? I also pair RX. I pair, like, I have a super minimal version of Isotope RX, and that's how I clean up the vocals with, I reduce noise, background noise. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I love Isotope. I think they're incredible. Okay. But there's going to be a point when I need to upgrade to Windows 11. My computer's going to die or something. Oh, you're not even happen. on Windows 11. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I, that, at that point, I am going to upgrade everything all at once. But I I'm think Windows 11 is almost at end of life. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever Windows is out whenever this okay. computer all dies. Right. We'll see how long we can ride on it. We'll see how it goes. I might be using the four track there for a while in between just to keep things going. We'll see. But oh, I have a, actually I have a I have a Tascam four track. I have a Tascam eight track, and I have a Zoom sixteen track. No, sixteen or eighteen or it's twenty. Maybe it's. 24. Oh, you do have the Zoom. I do have the Zoom. I haven't used it very much. The reason why I purchased that was so that I could use it for twenty four bit projects because Tascam yes. it stops at sixteen, and some people just prefer to use that like when I'm collabing with people or whatever. So okay. I just had that. I wanted to have that as an option, but um. But I barely use all the functions in it. Like you can use it as a drum machine, apparently, and all these other things. I'm just interested on in tracking my vocals, so I use the like the most basic uh, setup. But what do you yeah. use for a drum machine? Um, I have a Boss Boss from it's the orange and black one. I can't remember the model number. Uh, three hundred three. Okay. The, uh, the Boss 303, so it takes all the rolling drum machines and packs them into one groove box. Yeah. So the 808, 909, uh, 606, all of our favorites, and a few that you like never ever heard of before, some weird ones they just threw in there. I love that drum machine. It's just 
keeps going. I That's bought cool. it in the 90s. I still have it. Um, I have I have a TR-606 for the electro. If I go in an electro clash type of uh, angle for mm -hmm. anything, I prefer that. I have a MS-2000 uh, Korg synthesizer. Okay. Do you remember that one? Yeah. And you might even have that one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then I have my famous Casio that I purchased for 50 bucks at Toys R Us. <laughs> but that... That <laughs> I get a lot out of that. The yeah. upright bass sound on that thing is incredible. And if with a little tweaking, it really it's a really good sample on there. Like it's kind of it's amazing. I would yeah. not expect that. I um, I, no, I myself I use a, uh, a a Yamaha home synthesizer to the point where I did a show in Milwaukee a few months back, and the sound guy was just looking at it and smiling. And I'm like, I know it's old, and he's like, No, my grandmother had this. It reminds me of her. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. That's and so, so he was having a moment because the thing was so old because he remembered it from when he was a child and his grandmother had it at her wow. house. And I'm like, oh. and I'm on stage with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every I and the, the worst part about it is, is every once in a while, because you, you have to dial the numbers in for what the sound you want to use. And if yeah. you accidentally hit the wrong number and go to a different number, like if you go beyond 100, and sometimes I accidentally do that, it starts playing the pre-programmed settings <laughs> and it'll start oh, no. doing and I, you can't stop it. I actually have to turn it off and turn it on again to get it to stop. <laughs> at, that, at that point, they might as well just play over top of it and just I know. go for it. <laughs> let's, let's just roll with it, boys. Um, so here's a question I have for you. Uh, you do uh, more than I, and I've been looking to it recently, but you do collaborations with people, whether it be people collaborating on your stuff or you collaborating on other people's stuff. How yes. do you, how do you go about working that? How do you go about like, like who decides who's going to do what, or how do you even go about sharing the process? Cause most of the people you work with, they're not working on it with you in the same room. You guys are collaborating remotely. So First, how do you decide who does what or how do people approach you or you approach other people going, I want this done? Like, what's that like? I had a track recently where I, I liked everything about the track except the my bass stem was coming up short. So I was in need of a bass player. So I went on Fiverr and uh, researched oh. some bass players, reached out to them. And then they did they created an incredible bass that and it really makes, makes it just brought the song alive it was worth every penny and it wasn't even that expensive totally want to do that again hmm. but um with that it was simply being very clear in writing what i was looking for and okay. then but a lot of people on fiverr they they sort of interview you before they accept the job they're they they'll ask you a bunch of questions they'll always tell you to contact them before you actually purchase it so mm. you can you kind of go back and forth just have to be very very clear so you're both on the same page and then if it feels like a good fit they'll they'll send you the the um like the job and then you'll you can process it that that way i think that's the best way so instead sense. of going on there so i'm gonna use this guy and just click the job it's best to talk back and forth first make sure you're on the same page because not everyone's going to click or whatever but we clicked we went great mm -hmm. um and i just sent him I, I sent him the instrumental without the bass part. And then he just played it, played over top of it in his DAW and sent back just the bass part. And then I sent it, I had it professionally mixed. So I sent that along with the rest of my stems to the mix engineer. Mm -hmm. I stopped mixing my own stuff this year because oh, I- Oh, really? I, I'm like, I'm yeah, I'm not a mix engineer. I was just feeling my way through it or whatever, but- I'm just liking the results I'm getting from paying someone to do it. I feel like it brings up everything to another level. So I'm just focused on writing lyrics, doing the vocals and producing the music. And then I send it off. I do a rough demo mix to send mm -hmm. the engineer so they can hear what I'm going for. But uh, other than that, and that's, <laughs> that's pretty much what my mixes are anyway, right? So I just do that, send it off. And it comes back nice and shiny, sounding beautiful. So that's cool. And I, I have a com, I have a combo team. They one guy mixes and the other guy masters, and they work together. So I think that works well too because they talk back and forth to each other, and I just think that helps the overall process. It's not necessary, but it work. It's it's convenient too. Yeah. But yeah. And um, 
where was I? What was I starting with? Uh, for you went on Fiverr. Phone. Yeah. So the Fiverr is one way I do it if I want an individual musician. Uh, but then like Block Sonic, everyone's great about collabing. So Cheese and Pot C will reach out and say, we think you sound good on this track. And they'll send me the instrumental with usually with their verses. And then there'll be a blank spot where I'm supposed to to go and I'll write it, record it, just send them the acapella back. You just have to make story, sure you're starting at the zero point mm -hmm. from their instrumental, of course, so they'd sync it up correctly. I've had a lot of issues in the past, um, not with the Block Sonic people, because they're all pros, but with um, other random people from SoundCloud where they don't know how to sync up the hip hop vocals. They, they assume mm. that you always start on the downbeat, but that sometimes you come in before the, first beat sometimes you come in a little after and mm -hmm. and um cheese from cheese and pot c taught me what he does is he leaves part of the instrumental in the beginning and then mm. chops it off right before the acapella starts so the producer can sync up the beat and the 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 lead the leader looks like a leader beat and then they can just erase that um and then you're automatically synced up so i've been doing that ever since he taught me that's how he does it because hmm. I was running into that problem a lot with people and then getting back tracks that are like all out of sync. So, okay. Yeah. They, they, yeah. So you've, so you've reached out to people on Fiverr and then like when you've collaborated with uh, cheese and Potsy on, on block Sonic, like, do you, do you guys just go, Hey, I'm working on something. Let's do something together. Or it, which I know that that's the beauty of uh, block Sonic is it's really a, tight knit community of people yes. and, and it continues to, to grow to be that with the musicians that are on there. But like, how do you guys talk back and forth or go yeah, through that, this? That, I love that question. So there's a few different ways. Sometimes the track's all built, ready to go. Everything's done except for my part. And he'll send it and say, you want to jump on this? And I always say yes, because I love their music. Um, there was a time I reached out to Potsy. I asked him for a beat. If he had instrumentals, he sent me an instrumental. I was working on it for like a ridiculous amount of time. Like it went, it was more than a year, but I actually lost track of how many months it was. <laughs> and I kept telling him I'm working on it. Like he didn't care either. He wasn't ever even checking up on me, but I just want to let you know, I'm still working on that track. And, um, and then I just couldn't find the mood that was right for the track. So him and I jumped on a call and we were just shooting this shit. Right. And, um, I was telling him how that instrumental reminded me, uh, it sounded like, uh, like a futuristic space scape or something. And then it clicked. He's like, Oh, you mean like Zeopolis? Like that's the name of our, of his personal label, his personal website, um, and all this stuff. And then that's how the track, uh, Zeopolis came, uh, up. he told me about when he, he told me the story that when he was a kid, he had this fake um planet called zeopolis or i think it was a city on a planet <laughs> of called zeopolis. <laughs> and he went on and on and on about how he had this whole thing worked out in his head ever since he was a little kid and i'm like well that's the track right there so then then uh then we knew what to do but after like a year of trying to figure out what to do with the instrumental it just out of a conversation it just popped and then we knew what to do nice and went from there but mostly they they complete the track or i'll complete the track and say i i can hear your voice on this this is or this is a subject that that I think you would sound good on. Um, they always send me if they ever uh, rap about pizza. They always send those to me, yeah. so they know I'm a fellow pizza lover. So <laughs> that's that's real. <laughs> they just I just spoke with them last week, and they're like, we have another pizza track coming up, so we're gonna be sending you. <laughs> <Nice. laughs> yeah, it's a theme throughout their entire catalog. Uh, every every year, or every couple of years, they come up with a, a, a pizza themed track. So. Okay. <laughs> and one more collaboration I want to ask you about, with, or if this is a collaboration, but the Give Thanks video. It's an animated video that you released over on your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how, did you, how did you meet the artists that did that, and how did that come about? That was a fiver. Um, okay. And I dug through, I, found, I narrowed it down to five animators that I really liked. And I re started reaching out to them and talking back and forth, and I clicked with this guy. Okay. And yeah, we, we seem to be on the same page. He was into it. I was into what he was doing and I'm very happy with how it turned out. I like, I like it. I like it when you turn off all the lights and watch it. Yeah. There's like extra things in the background. Like there are people walking around and shad, uh, like shadows or like silhouettes of people, which you don't necessarily see in a lit room, which I think is really cool. So there's this subconscious 
vibe going on with it too. Okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, that was a Fiverr collab. Okay. Um, I that's sent the, him a song. I never, I never yeah. thought of doing but, that, but that's, that's really cool that you've done that multiple times and for multiple different reasons. I always go on Fiverr and think I'm going to find something and then I get there and I'm like, what am I looking for? You know, yeah. <laughs> I right, go there just to right. check it out for curiosity, but you've actually got a purpose for being there. Yeah, um, I never go in there without a purpose. That's okay. true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, I want to talk about the one most brilliant thing that a net label has done, and maybe other ones have. It's just that I know the Block Sonic net label. But when you started out, you said you're the host of the Block Sonic podcast. Yes. And I think it's brilliant the whole thing where it's like, you guys are they're releasing music on the net label all the time and it's like well let's do a music show of the music that's on this label and it's brilliant now you started hosting it originally potsy was hosting it i was actually on the show i want to say a year ago maybe two years ago yeah and and uh when did you start hosting the show why did that happen that was a little over a year ago and potsy went on sabbatical he wanted to take a break he had some stuff going on. He didn't have time to do it. So I took over temporarily for him. And then it was a six month slot. And we, when he was time for him to come back, he asked if I just wanted to continue to do it. Okay. So um, he's thinking about coming back in a different capacity. He has some ideas, but we'll, we'll see if that pans out. So we might see more of pot C on the podcast front. We'll see what happens, but but yeah, he ended it over to me and I gladly took it. I really enjoyed doing it. I had a college radio show back in the late eighties and I, it reminds me of that. So mm -hmm. I'm, it gives me that feeling. And I, I just love radio and on both sides as a listener and as the master of ceremonies. So, right. yeah. So I, I took it over gladly and um, shout out to Potsy for handing that over and that shout out to Long John for, I think he, told Potsy that I might be a good fit for that if Potsy wasn't already thinking about that. Um, Long John, Potsy, Cheese, and I, we get a lot of video calls and hang out and whatever, so it just seemed like a natural fit, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not. I'm actually not quite sure why they decided me, but I, I, um, I'm I, glad to take take up the helm for now. I was going to say, own it, man. What do you mean they're not, <laughs> you're not sure why they decided to use you? <laughs> I yeah I don't know I don't think they ever saw me in a DJ capacity so that's why maybe I I was you know I wasn't sure they've only ever heard me like rapping or making music or whatever but so I All you right. know I don't think I've ever they ever heard a, a a sample of me doing that exact thing so that's what I mean but yeah. yeah yeah All <laughs> right and then one more thing uh what things you have coming up what releases what projects do you have coming up that you'd like to tell people about Um this year I have a few more releases. Definitely, I, so I always release a track for Net Label Day. Um, I mark that on my calendar each year, J July fourteenth, and I always definitely make sure I pull out a track out of my catalog, my unreleased catalog, to polish mm -hmm. up and put out. Um, so I'm definitely coming out with an instrumental track this year. Usually, my tracks always have vocals, so I'm planning on bringing out an instrumental track, which is different for me. Okay, um, but that'll be a fun little experiment to try. Um, and I have a bunch of releases lined up for the rest of the year. Um, I've been releasing singles over on Spotify separately. And what I, I think of what I want to do is I want to, after I get some real world feedback from putting them out in the world over there, then I think I want to compile them and do an XL on block Sonic, something like that. So I've been, I don't know if you know, but I've been doing pretty much all singles over at Block Sonic. I, I'm the king of the yeah. uni drops. So it would be nice to do either um, one of the six on the seven is like the their EP version of an EP that they, the idea of the six on a seven is what would actually fit on a seven inch 45 RPM record and then re replicate that digitally by the time constraints. So I, I might be interested in doing that or just a, a classic ep or an album we'll see how, how it pans out but the plan is to just i'm just testing some stuff now as singles um, okay even outside of luxonic that i'm going to bring back to luxonic as a package that's the plan so nice for this year yeah all right so we'll see how that goes and if people wanted to check out your stuff where should they go do that just 
Bloxonic yeah. itself or uh, anywhere else? Yeah, definitely Bloxonic. Uh, Bloxonic's the place to go to check me out for sure. All right. Yep. And definitely check out the the Block Report, the podcast. Yeah, check for sure. Check it out. Yep. Oh, we always have our, all the new releases from the previous month are on there. So it's a great way to stay on top of what's going on. Even if you don't have time to listen to all the new releases, you can get a sample of them on the Block Report. So <laughs> check that out. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for talking with me today. All right. Thank you for having me. Pew, pew.